What's going on, guys? Welcome to another episode of Bro History. It's Henry Zamoda and my good friend, Danny Abdeljabar. How are you this morning? Chilling, man, as per usual. Interesting that you're saying this morning, too, because we're not normally podcasting in the morning. <laughs> yeah, typically, this is a very unique recording situation. Usually, we're recording um, deep into the night. Like, we'll start recording around 10 p.m. and record until, like, you know, midnight. Now we're doing it in the morning. It's eleven forty one AM on a Saturday, which is uh which is uh And it doesn't sound super early for y'all, but like you gotta remember that, you know, we have other things going on in our lives and like, you know, we just plowed through an entire week of regular day jobs and probably had a few drinks the night before. So eleven forty one in the morning on a Saturday for our lifestyles is like might as well be the crack of dawn. I am <laughs> I am loaded up on coffee right now so i think (laughs) i'm able to get to get through it yeah um but yeah let's we have a lot to talk about so i guess we should get straight into um the rise of mao and the chinese communist uh, party and i guess i'll i'll um start off by saying that it was very unlike the russian bolshevik revolution yeah so the Chinese Communist Party didn't rise to power through some dramatic seizure of the state during a political crisis like the abolition of the Russian monarchy in Russia's mm. case. Um, the, the CCP's seizure of the state was a long and very brutal process that lasted decades. In fact, the Chinese Communist movement was almost completely wiped out a number of times. So. What we're really interested in exploring today is how the CCP went from being outlawed to taking total control of the government. So where where do you think we should start? Because I feel like there's like a million different places that we can that we can go from. It's really difficult to pick a starting point here, but in the early 20th century, China was trying to expunge itself from its old ideas. China was being exploited by Western powers and in Japan. And they call this a century of humiliation. Right. China hadn't modernized yet. Meanwhile, their neighbor, Japan, was already competing with Western powers. Japan had already defeated Russia in a war. Um, They had very much modernized their economy um, along with their cities. And in China, they had not gone through this this period of modernization, like the Meiji Restoration that started in Japan in, in the 1860s. Right. And we, we touched on this in previous episodes when we were going through like the um, kind of ancient history of China. And keep in mind that, you know, up until this point for like thousands of years, the Chinese uh, uh, economy and and lifestyle was centered around this agricultural, uh, um, you know, boom, you know, taking advantage of the fertile areas, uh, you know, that they that they had access to. Uh, but at this juncture, um, you know, we're already well beyond, you know, the the. Um, uh, industrial revolution and well into it and all these other countries are, are producing at speeds and at paces that you know outperform China in in their agricultural economy so they're playing catch up throughout this like century of humiliation that they're uh, that they that they self-describe as yeah and many people started to reject the idea of monarchy mm-hmm. um, they started looking at the ancient Chinese traditions as like such as Confucianism as dead weight from the past and to put this into context they did start having access to western science and political philosophy Uh, chinese workers had exposure to things like european labor unions and schools and textbooks textbooks and political institutions right there were chinese students in france who were exposed to um, french factory conditions or french labor unions and they were able to contrast that with what they were currently used to and Shanghai needless, needless to say, it, it definitely had a, a profound impact. I think on on the on the collective consciousness of the Chinese people at the time living in the in the Qing in the in the uh, death knells of the Qing Dynasty here. Yes, and when the Qing Dynasty implodes in 1911, the state falls into the hands of a military dictator named Yun Shikai. Oh, geez. Okay. Well. Tell me, what does uh, Yun Shikai do when he takes the power? I can guess, probably. <laughs> so when Yun Shikai becomes the dictator of China, he quickly tries to crown himself emperor. So mm. he 
tries to reinstate a dynasty, his own dynasty. However, the move is unpopular. And it's unpopular not only to the public, but it's also unpopular by their foreign supporters, like mm-hmm. Japan and mm-hmm. some of the European countries who had vested interests and investments in China. They all turn on him. So he's a, he ends up having to resign, and he dies shortly after. But after Yun Shikai dies, China ends up being ran by a bunch of warlords. So it's like basically back to square one again. Yeah. Right. Well, yeah, we're back to square one. So one of the main themes of these uh, episodes of China we've been doing has has um, really diving into the point that China has China as one unified, solidified state like it is right now is the exception rather than the norm. Right. The majority of Chinese history, China is fragmented. And that well, has it. It depends on who you ask, right? Because certain Chinese historians say that for two thirds of Chinese uh, history that it was unified. Um, but it really depends on what you mean by quote unified, right? Like you have to get very specific about unification because you might you might argue that they were still quote unified in this particular area, even though they were run by a bunch of warlords. So it's it it depends. <laughs> there's a, there's a bit of nuance there, but I, I think what's what's important is that they go through these cycles you know, very, very frequently of, um, you know, uh, warring states to, you know, unification to warring states, to unification, warring states, to unification. And every time they reunify, they don't reunify as, as strictly, uh, the, the victor, right. It's not like the culture of the best wins. It becomes like a totally different thing after, after they reunify almost every single time. And I think that the same is going to be true here, um, for sure. Yeah, and in this case, the vacuum that is created is filled by a bunch of different military cliques mm-hmm. that were that were corrupt and abusive. And um, but I think the genesis of Marxist philosophy being inserted into Chinese culture can be attributed directly to the twisted policies that came out of the Paris Peace Conference and the Treaty of Versailles. You mean the Paris Climate Change Accords? No, the, the Paris Peace, the negotiations of basically what the world was, what the victors of World War One were going to do with all the spoils of of uh, the German Empire and the Ottoman Empire and all that. I got, I got you. Uh, everyone they beat, and um, they're figuring out what they were going to do with the world. Like, how are we going to shape the world after we mm-hmm. just destroyed it? So, are are we about to t- talk about like the Sykes Picot of the East? Um, kind of. This this is similar to Sykes Picot in some way, as in it caused a lot of issues. <laughs> During World War One, Japan joined the side of the Allies. The British reached out to them, and they asked them for help securing shipping lanes in the Pacific and the Indian Oceans. Mm-hmm. Basically, what Japan was doing during the war was seizing German merchant ships and German colonies in Asia, while. Um, the German army was preoccupied on the Western and Eastern fronts. In reality, what Japan was doing was that they were just consolidating their own power and increasing their sphere of influence in China. Right. And after the war, Japan was awarded with a bunch of German colonies that were previously part of China and China wanted them back. China had actually, they had not, put boots on the ground during the war but they did provide allies with labor right so they were they were making all of the things and i guess maybe they felt some kind of way about oh well we helped the war effort by building all the stuff and you know getting all the crop and you know creating uh all of this uh, uh product that they were consuming during the war that they couldn't you know create themselves because they had such a huge drain of manpower uh, on the Western and Eastern fronts. Uh, and so they, I think, rightfully believe that they deserve something, but they probably got a pretty raw deal out of this. Yeah, well, this light from the Allies provokes a massive student protest known right. as the May 4th movement. Mm-hmm. And the Chinese who participated in these protests, they become the audience to the common turn. And the, the common turn or Communist International was basically the Soviet branch of of a government that advocated for world communism. So they would assist leftist, go- leftist, gover- uh, leftist groups in overthrowing their government. Um, Stalin actually 
had to dissolve it prior to World War II to avoid antagonizing the Allies, but that's a whole different topic. But the, the Communist International was basically the bureau of the Soviet government that would assist leftist groups in organizing and um, actually becoming like part of the state. Right. So and like how, the, we, how we try to spread, quote, democracy all over the world. They had their own little. Yeah, um, exactly. Like, like group NGOs that was from the like U.S. NGOs. Like exactly. Um, but the common turn, they start sending agents to China to assist the process of revolutionary organization. Now, what's interesting is that the agents from Communist International were involved both in the establishment of the CCP and the reorganization of Sun Yat-sen's Nationalist Party. And mm -hmm. um, we can get to the Nationalist Party in a second. So but, you're telling me they were playing both sides? Yeah, and it, it was interesting <laughs> what they did. So these advisors worked with the Marxist study groups and helped them organize into a political party. And in 1921, they assisted them with structuring the first their, their first um party congress in shanghai um one of the first delegates is a guy named mao zedong who was mao was from the hunan province in central china and he had been exposed to these study groups while working as a librarian assistant in beijing but at this moment mao is still very in the early 20s mao is not really an important figure in the communist party yet he doesn't really start rising through the ranks until later on I didn't until actually know that I didn't know that Mao was a librarian. Excuse me, a librarian's assistant. That's pretty funny. Yeah. <laughs> like this they evil dictator guy starts off as a librarian. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty funny. That's that is kind of weird. Um but the Soviet advisors to both the CCP and the nationalist they suggest that they merge into a coalition together. All right, um, wait. So, so wait, wait. Before before you jump in that United Front, can you give some background on that um, Chinese Nationalist Party you were talking about? Yeah. So the Nationalist Party, um, the CNP, the Chinese Nationalist Party, they go by a bunch of different names. Um, most people from the U.S. or the West call them the Nationalist Party. Was the political organization that Sun Yat-sen founded. Uh, Sun Yat-sen is the is considered the father of the nation and was actually the president of China for 45 days until he was he, he abdicated to Yun Shikai. Mm -hmm. I think he was like uh, Yun Shikai is a, is a uh, military dictator and uh, I'll probably I could end up dead if I don't abdicate my power. So I'm right. going to <laughs> choose to live. But he was a political leader during the rebellion against uh, the Qing dynasty and, and was um, the founder of the Chinese Nationalist Party. And, and um, they formed in 1919. Yeah. His alliance with the Soviet Union had more of a practical relationship than a relationship built off some shared ideological vision. So friends with benefits then. Yeah. Yeah. So... And this, a lot of countries that allied with the Soviet Union, who were former British, British or French colonies, had the same type of relationship where mm. they were wary of. They were put in a position where they wanted to divorce themselves from influence from uh, their former uh, colonizers, but they also didn't want to. Um, they were they were distrustful of the Soviet Union, but they needed them. They saw mm. the Soviet Union as type of this um, stalwart against the West. So that's why there was these relationships that were forming between the Soviet Union and um, the Arab nationalists in the Middle East, um, India, and places like Egypt, Nasser's Egypt. They weren't communists, but they were like, Communist. Well, we're going to be put up against the West. We need to have an ally. We need to have a powerful ally somewhere. Right. And the Soviet Union was trying to gain access into these countries. Now, um, Sun Yat-sen allied with the Soviets because they gave back all of Russia's Chinese imperial possessions. In addition, 
Sun Yat-sen needed help doing all the operational stuff that a political party does. Right. He was a charismatic leader, but he wasn't really much of an organizer. And the communists made the Chinese nationalist a much more effective political organization. And I think that's true today. I think leftist groups are a lot better at organization than right-wing groups. Yeah, probably. Almost objectively. Yeah. Like, mm -hmm. say what, whatever your political ideology, if you lean left or right, especially in America's case, I feel that left-wing groups are um, much more savvy in, in, like, the political organization process and collectively joining together. I'd agree with Would that. Would you agree with that statement? Yeah, totally. I think they, 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 uh, they really have that kind of um, organization and hierarchical structure and... and and even just like, you know, real basic, like, you know, here are the steps and they lay them out very clearly and define them um, to, to, to. Yeah, they're left wing groups are better at. And I think this goes from, you know, my limited experience on this earth since I was young. Um, Demo the Democrats were, I mean, I guess a lot of people don't even consider them left wing. But they're much more, they're able to like identify a goal and achieve it. You know, like they'll say something like we have a goal to do this to out to um, legal gay marriage, to uh, right. make gay marriage legal. Mm -hmm. And that when they say that, you know, it's going to be done. You right. know what I mean? Like, because they're when very they say specific something, about they it. They'll do it. In a lot of cases, the Republican Party is like, we're going to lower taxes or we're going to balance the budget. Right. Meanwhile, like, how? <laughs> we, yeah. every single year we are... Um, in more and more debt. Right. And, so, and, and to, to be clear, though, like there's plenty of things that Democrats say that they'll do and then they don't achieve. But that doesn't that doesn't under uh, like underwrite the or, or uh, underscore the fact that they um, that they do a pretty good job at trying to organize an effort around trying to get it done. Right. So they'll, they'll outline the steps on how to get it done. And then, you know, maybe they hit a home run every now and again and maybe they don't. Um, but the point is like how they get there, the road to it, you know, that organizational skill is super useful. And I think, you know, when we're looking at Sun Yat-sen, you know, he's kind of like this like visionary kind of dude, uh, but he doesn't have any hmm, uh, kind of like political mechanisms to help him achieve those like visions. Does that make sense? Is that, is that basically what you're talking about? Yeah, exactly. Um, so as I was saying before, Communist International advised the CCP and the Chinese nationalists to merge into one coalition. And actually, merge is probably not the best word. Um, there wasn't like a, a former, like they weren't the same political party, like a former, uh, a formal merger between the two. Um, under the terms of this united front, members of the CCP could join the Nationalist Party and serve as officers. Mm -hmm. um, for example, Mao was the leader of the Peasant Bureau in the Nationalist Party. His experience here is actually going to play a, a pretty important role in the future right. um, for his political development. But it's sort of like, um, if you want to like separate progressives and Democrats or maybe Green Party members and Democrats, it, they're not, it's not a former coalition, but a communist can join the CCP and... Um, and that was okay. And that was okay. Like you could you could have be in two different parties at the same time. Um, but there wasn't like they didn't share like party like uh, delicate seats and things like that. Right. So CCP members would join and they would help the nationalists with things like their propaganda, their political messaging, and um, ultimately their organization. And in return, what the CCP would get was legal protection because, uh, I mean, frankly, it, they needed it. Yeah. Like, what do you think happens when a, what do you think is going to happen when in China in the 1920s when you organize a labor protest? You're going to get your ass beat. <laughs> That's what. Yeah. <laughs> There's going to be guys coming out and beating your ass with fucking rocks and sticks. Like. Right. If you're if you're like trying to pull like some labor stunt or labor strike. Right. And then you're also like, going to hey, we're going to unionize. You know? <laughs> so there had to be this political uh, this political um, protection, especially in these warlord areas. Right. Well, you're not going to work. 
You guys are going to unionize? I'm beat your ass, and then we're going to find somebody else to do your job. Yeah. So here's the thing. The Nationalist Party, they have a left wing and a right wing. Hmm. CCP members were mainly collaborating with the left wing of the party. And there ends up being a lot of friction between the CCP and the, the right wing of the Nationalist Party. Hmm. And, and um, things kind of fracture. The beginning of the fracture between the, the Communist National Party and the Chinese Nationalist is when Sun Yat-sen dies. Sun Yat-sen dies in 1925. Of, he dies of, uh, I think he dies of pancreatic, can- pancreatic cancer. Um, I'm not sure, but he dies of cancer. And um, leadership is passed to Sun's ideological protege, Jing Wei, who is a writer and a member of the party's left wing. I think it's kind of important to talk about like some of the ideologies that comes out of Sun Yat-sen and is furthered by um, Jing Wei, um, because it I think it gives some really good context between um, the friction that you were talking about between the CCP and the and the and the right wing uh, of the Nationalist Party. Because you're right, this, the CCP members are definitely coordinating with the left wing, you know, and the ideas that they have were very leftist and actually very Western. Um, so there's this. Uh, um, set of principles is called the three principles of the people uh that sun yat-sen uh developed and uh in short the three are nationalism democracy and welfare or livelihood uh, the translations are a little wonky I'll, I'll, I'll explain more in a second um but basically these principles like first like appear they, they also appeared in the um in the chinese national anthem for the uh, republic of china um, so that's how like ingrained in the in the ph- political philosophy they were. But um, basically, when there was this uh, revived China society, uh, and it was formed sometime around like 1894, um, and at the time, Sun only had two principles, which were nationalism and, and democracy. And he picked up that third idea, the welfare or the livelihood one, um, during a three year trip to to Europe uh, in the late 1800s, uh, and basically uh, the ideology was super influenced by the West and especially his experiences in places like Europe, but also especially uh, by the United States. Uh, he actually um, uh, uh, has credited a line from uh, Lincoln's Gettysburg Address, government of the people, by the people, for the people. And he says that that is an inspiration for his uh, three principles. So it's actually really, really fascinating to, to see how how um, uh, these develop. And, and this kind of jumps kind of calls back to you know an earlier thing that we said in this episode where you know uh, a lot of these chinese uh, um you know people were out all over the world learning things learning how people in the west were doing stuff you know and they were they were picking up on the cues and taking notes and they wanted to bring it back home to china and i think you know there's nothing was different here uh with sun here um but let me let me explain a little bit about the three uh, principles, just so you can get an idea for what they mean, because I think the translations are a little weird. Um, so it's, it, it, it might be easier to kind of uh, define them a bit better. So there was the first one, so civic nationalism. They uh, in Chinese it's minzu. Uh, so it's it's translated n- normally as nationalism. There's a, a few different ways to say it, but I think this one's probably the clearest of the three. Um, and it describes a nation rather than a group of persons united by a purpose. Uh, so it's, it's, that's why we use the word nationalism when we translate it. Um, and uh, he basically, Sun wanted independence uh, from a lot of these imperialist, you know, uh, dominations uh, that, that they were getting, you know, during the you know, century of uh, humiliation. And he thought that uh, China had to develop a, like a China nationalism as opposed to an ethnic nationalism uh, to unite all the different ethnicities of China. Uh, you might recall some of these ideas from earlier episodes on China, right? You know, so like superseding, um, you know, your ethnic uh, 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 culture uh, in place of a national culture. Um, but the, the main um, groups at the time, uh, there were five of them. Uh, there were the Han, the Mongols, the Tibetans, the Manchus, and the Muslims, like the Uyghurs, um, uh, which together they actually um, came together and, and were the five colors in the flag of the first republic so that's what that flag stood for 
Uh, and he believed that uh, China needed like this kind of national consciousness uh, to unite the Han in the face of the imperialist aggression. You know, so uh, a lot of these tropes we were talking about in previous episodes, and it just keeps coming up again and again and again, you know, like when smaller ethnic or even cultural groups uh, uh, collide. And, you know, in order to unite them, we have to find something that is above them. And in this case, it's the state, it's the nation. Um, so the second one was uh, uh, governance rights. So Min Kwan, or sometimes uh, more often translated as democracy. Uh, now, for Sun, this represented basically just straight up Western constitutional government, but with like some specifically Chinese like flavor. Uh, so you had political life divided uh, into uh, sets of powers. So the power of politics and the power of governance. Um, so the power of politics was about how people express their political wishes. So just like you know, here we uh, have elections, we do recalls, we have uh, referendums, things like that. So you you would consider these like sim uh, like civil rights, um, and these wishes would be. Uh, um, basically put in like parliamentary or national assemblies, right? Or for us, it would be like a house of representatives, if you will, right? Um, and then the power of politics, um, oh, excuse me, the power of governance uh, are the power of administration, right? So this is a little bit expanded from the like European or the American um, constitutional theory, but they still have the first three branches that we have. Um, so uh, the legislative, um, the uh, uh, executive, and the uh, judicial. Uh, but they added two more, um, which uh, were basically holdovers from you know ancient, uh, it, like traditional Chinese administrative systems, um, which were called yuans or literally courts. So they also had uh, the control yuan and the examination yuan. Um, which I don't really have time to get into exactly what they were. But what you need to know uh, for this governmental part, uh, the democracy part, is that they had this, the same three uh, uh, checks and balances that we did, plus two more that were like specifically Chinese. Uh, and then the last of the three principles was the welfare rights one. Uh, this one is murkiest in terms of translation, especially when you read the text to try to get like a good word for it. But it could be translated as like the people's welfare, which is expressly pretty communist. Uh, livelihood was another good one um, or government for the people. Uh, I think welfare works pretty good. Um, but you can think of this as like social welfare. Um, and it's and it's uh, it's apparently like a direct criticism of uh, unregulated capitalism. Um, and uh, he was very much um, influenced by, uh, you know, American thinkers like Henry George uh, and and wanted to introduce a George's tax reform. And what that looked like was uh, basically uh, having only land tax. Uh, there's a quote um, about land value that Sun uh, Yat Sen said, which is the only means of supporting the government uh, is an infinitely just, reasonable and equitably distributed tax. And on it, we will found our new system. And that tax was land tax. So that's that's how they, they didn't do income taxes. They didn't do any other types of taxes, just like a land tax. Um, but he divided the, uh, the, the welfare or the livelihood into four specific areas. So clothing, food, housing, and mobility. And basically try to plan out exactly how the you know, Chinese government could take care of those things for the people. Um, but of course, he died before he was able to fully explain what he meant by this part, which is probably why this is the one that never uh, has stuck around for very long. <laughs> um, and another thing I'll add is that he his dream was to unite all these former territories of the Qing Dynasty right. into one into one uh, republic, one state. Mm -hmm. And he obviously dies prior to that taking place because at this point China is still fragmented. There isn't like one. There isn't a monopoly of violence on China. I, that's the best way to look at it. Right. It's a bunch of cities. Some of these cities have um, a lot of international influence. Uh, some of these areas are controlled by warlords and organized crime. Um, these political parties have these minor strongholds in different parts of the country and um they ha by no means have um like the monopoly on violence in order to establish a state um but when he dies 
when when Sun Yat Sen dies, um, he, I guess, technically his his uh, power is passed on to Jing Wei, who's his ideological um, successor. But in response, the right wing of the party elevates their guy, and their guy is named Chiang Kai Shek. Um, Chiang Kai Shek is probably the name that you're familiar with right. here. Because he was the president um, and head of the, the Chinese Nationalist Party during World War II. But Chiang Kai-shek is a military man. And they promote him to commander-in-chief of the National Revolutionary Army. Ironically enough, Chiang Kai-shek was sent to the Soviet Union to learn about the Red Army and the Bar Bolshevik political program. And while he's there, he does respect the uh, Soviet's ability to organize. He respects the Soviet military, but he grows to despise everything about communism and what they represent. So he mm -hmm. becomes a very vibrant anti-communist um, based off his experience um, in the Soviet Union. He becomes popular because he leads a very successful military campaign to reunify China. So this is known as a northern expedition. Right. He wages um, he wages war against the warlords across the country to establish that monopoly of violence, to um, establish that vision that Sun Yat Sen wanted. So he is the guy who um, takes the military and tries to actively um, establish the Chinese, you know, one Chinese state. Um, the base of operations for the Chinese Nationalist Party is in the Guangdong province, which is the which is southeastern China, like on the coast. And by the spring of 1927, the Nationalist Revolutionary Army captures um, three major cities that are that are very important. Um, he captures Wuhan, he captures Shanghai, and he captures Nanjing, and he also absorbs many of the warlords that they were fighting into their own ranks. So um, the NRA, the National Revolutionary Army, the NRA, um, not to be confused with the National Rifle Organization, um, <laughs> Association, excuse me, um, increases from 100,000 soldiers to about 200, to, to a quarter million soldiers. That's, that's and crazy. the success of the campaigns promote his status as the alternative leader to Jiang Wei. I don't know. This probably doesn't last very long, though, right? When when does it turn south? In by April 1927, Chiang Kai-shek consolidates enough power to end the alliance with the Chinese uh, Communist Party. Not only does he choose to end the United Front, but he also decides to totally eliminate the Chinese Communist movement. Hmm. What he does is he declares that Jiang Wei's government in Wuhan, because there's a schism between the Nationalist Party when Chiang Kai-shek rises up. So Jiang Wei's government is in Wuhan. Um, Chiang Kai-shek, he establishes the capital uh, of the uh, Nationalist Party in Nanjing. Mm -hmm. So what he declares is that Jiang Wei's government is infiltrated by communists and was no longer legitimate. Meanwhile, the power base of the Chinese Communist Party was in Shanghai. So there's like four different cities where like different people are claiming different things. Yeah, it's confusing, but it's <laughs> just, I think the easiest way to kind of envision this is that there's no like state here. There's, yeah, there's no just centralized these power. cities with different power bases. And, yeah. Um, the, the fight is to create that power base. Like that's what this fight is all about. Like who is getting, we're, we're establishing more power. We're creating a stronger state. Now who's going to control that state. Mm -hmm. Now, something I'm not totally clear about is in, um, I'm not, I don't fully understand the reasons for this is that a communist international advises the communist, the uh, CCP leaders to stage a, insurrection or riot or some type of coup in Shanghai, their main base of operations or their, you know, their, their main power base. 
and at this time Shanghai is not is um is not part of the Chinese nationalist power base at all. It's an inter well, it is part of it. They just recently took control of it, but it's an international city. It's a um it's it has a lot of influence from colonial powers and different organized crime groups and secret societies. It's not a um it's like an international city, kind of like Hong Kong is. Right. The pretext for um, th- this creates the pretext for King Chiang Kai Shek to violently try to solve his communist problem. So he declares martial law in Shanghai. What he does to purge the communists is that he he starts to conspire with Shanghai's underworld most notably a secret society called the Green Gang to purge all the communists from the city. The Green Gang. Green Gang, Green Gang, Green Gang. Green Gang. Gang Green! <laughs> Let's go Jets! <laughs> so he, he unleashes the, the Jets on Shanghai. <laughs> and that wouldn't be in an effective way. <laughs> Probably so not. win anything to unleash the Jets. <laughs> What he basically does, though, in conspiring with not only the Chinese underworld, but also a lot of the international governments that have stakes in Shanghai, like the Japanese and the British and the French, um, he has like an, an executive order 67 type of thing. Oh, from is this Star when Wars. he kills all the Jedi? <laughs> yeah, like an executive order 67. He says, right. kill all communists. It's open right. season on commies mm. in Shanghai. And he even equips these secret societies with official uniforms. So this ends up being a bloodbath. They kill thousands of them. Mm-hmm. Um, I've seen estimates between 5,000 to 10,000 people were killed in these in these uh, purges, Jesus. these communist purges, including the one of the co-founders of the CCP, uh, Li Daozhao. I think that's how you pronounce his name, Li Daozhao. Daozhao. The events leads Communist International in Moscow to break ties with the Chinese nationalist. And um, I guess the ultimate result is that the CCP is driven into the shadows. Um, They go from a social movement that has roughly 10 million people associated with the party. It's it's a a larger party. It's, It's a large party. Take in mind, China is... China's population is big, is right. large, even at this time. Kind of always um, has been. <laughs> the Chinese communist movement becomes like this clandestine struggle. You know what I mean? Mm. Yeah. Rather than this like formal political organization. Yeah, like they became the QAnon. You know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and um, the communism was... So I guess the easiest way to uh, explain this is that the CCP at this time, they were kind of forced into an armed struggle for their own survival. So they had to act off their survival instincts. Um, you know, fighting back was like the only option for them to survive as like a political organization. But the problem is, is that the CCP wasn't a military. They were a political party who organized like labor unions. Right. So they didn't have like a military wing of the Chinese Communist Party at this time. Not yet. <laughs> yeah. So this is when Mao starts to become a significant figure in the CCP. Right. It Mr. Librarian out, Assistant. The Librarian Assistant becomes yeah. a significant uh, figure. <laughs> it tur- he's the one who who uh, creates the Red Army of China. Jesus. <laughs> it turns out though. And this is what, how he's able to do it. He's smart. That's his episode. He's smart. The rise of Mao. He's smart. He's smart. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> it turns out that Mao had spent a lot of time in the country as head of the Peasant Bureau. Yeah, you were saying and that before. Yeah. He's he's in touch with, you know, farmers and, and um, rural, um, you know, people in the rural areas of China that um, I guess are very neglected. Right. There's really no structures of power there. Right, because the CCP was mostly focused on, like, urban, like, you know, industrial labor unions, right? Like, like factory labors, uh, factory unions and shit, right? So they, they were kind of, like, ignoring 
the the peasants. Yeah, they didn't really. Communism was largely a, a, in China at this movement was mainly focused on like factory workers. Mm -hmm. um, but Mao puts together a new model for the Chinese communist movement that prioritizes the peasant class, and they're forced to retreat to um, the southern Jiangxi province where they create a rural base for the the movement and what they're doing in this rural base is that they create the first experiments of communism in china so they practice things like the land reform and um structuring you know family structures and um hierarchy they start doing whatever you would i'm I don't think we're going to get too far into like specifics on Marxist philosophy today, <laughs> but they start playing out those Marxist experiments in these rural bases. So, so they they go out into the woods and they make like a commie commune. <laughs> yeah, essentially that's exactly what they do. They make like a communist commune out in the middle of the mountains, Fair. where they you know where they're a little bit more shielded from um, the Chinese nationalist army, and these programs are eventually used in the People's Republic of China. But right now in the 1930s, they're just experimenting. They create a Red Army based on the Soviet model. So these Red Army bases start sprouting up in places where, um, places in the mountains and countryside um, where there is not really a, um, there's really not any social control. And the issue though that they have is that these rural bases were isolated from each other. Hmm. So the party's power center was still always in the, was still in Shanghai, but it just went underground. The underground movement in Shanghai, it eventually is rooted out by the Chinese nationalist system. Like they, it, the Chinese nationalists are able to eventually kind of create like these intelligence networks that can kind of figure out who the communists are and, and, and further implement purges. So they're almost completely wiped out at this point. Which makes the um, rise of Mao, you know, it, it's I kind of trouble kind of contemplating this, but as much as I think Mao was an awful man and a bad leader, and <laughs> uh, you know, I don't endorse communism. However, it's like a pretty kind of inspirational story in some ways. The rise, the, I know. the, the I mean, uh, going unbreakable from... will. Of the Chinese Communist Party, like you can't help but respect how they're able to put things together, and for sure, you know, I mean, what's your feeling humble, on that? Hum, humble librarian's assistant, you know, works with the peasants who were overlooked, you know, decides that you know the country was going in the wrong direction, and and says, you know what, fuck it, we're gonna we're gonna do this right, we're gonna set up our own little thing, and builds a little communist commune, and then just starts going from there it's yeah you gotta respect the un unbreakable will of the movement um even though the policies may have been extremely flawed now um at this moment Chiang kai-shek goes on to unify the country um he militarily <laughs> militarily but here's the problem there's a looming threat outside of china and that threat is the Japanese Empire, who has been kind of picking on China for the past 40 years. Poking the them. little brother has, it's like a situation where you have the, you have an older brother and a younger brother, but the younger brother ends up being like, you know, a stud athlete. Yeah, you know? he hits puberty and suddenly he's six foot tall and like, you know, poking his, his uh, chubby older brother in the eye and he can't do anything about it anymore. Japan it Japan has been um, basically using Japan, China as their backyard. Um, they have a lot of like business interest and imperial interest in, in Chinese areas and the different cities. Um, yeah, and they have like rail lines and stuff, right? Like, they have they rail lines, trade routes, mm -hmm. um, just a lot of influence and interest in China, and they are um, protecting imperial possessions. And those were the possessions the, they got from the like East Sykes Pico, right? Yeah. So there starts to be after 
Chiang Kai-shek unifies the country, there starts to be these confrontations between the Japanese and the nationalist military units. Um, however, Chiang Kai-shek sees the activities. At this moment, he still sees the Chinese communist movement as more dangerous than the Japanese. Um, so I, I speculate that he thought that even if the Japanese were to have like an, an be uh, very influential in Chinese society. There was probably still a place for him to in the, within the power structure. And a communist-ran country, there was no power. There was no place for him in that structure. That's the way I think that he decided. He saw the Chinese communists as a larger threat than the actual than the Japanese military. Right. At least probably that's my speculation. Um, he launches a series of encirclement campaigns where he basically puts these he puts a blockade around these communist based areas and um i said based areas these like the based base <laughs> based <areas. laughs> in in october of 1934 they the communists decide that they just can't resist these encirclement campaigns any longer and um there's another base area in northwestern China that's far away, centered in a, in a small town called Yan'an. They decide to break out of, of uh, Zhanghai, which is in southern China, and march over to Yan'an. And in mid-October, 115,000 people, they break out from this encirclement, and they... They go on the long march to the Yan'an. When they arrive to Yan'an, you know, only 15,000 people what? are left within the movement. So um, during this march, they're constantly being harassed by Chinese nationalist forces. They lost um, 100,000 people? Yeah. Jesus. They're, they're being harassed by, um, by Chinese nationalist forces. They're engaging in... Uh, warfare against them it's um it's a it's a brutal moment but during this moment the guy who becomes the main power uh the the leader of the ccp is mao zedong this is where he assumes the position of chairman of the party when they arrive in yan'an this is known as the the great age of yan'an this is where it begins where uh the, the chinese communist party they recognize this of where they, they recognize um, in 1934 when they arrive in Yunnan as like the true movement, the, the beginning of the Chinese Communist Revolution. Like that's where, you know, year one is. And in Yunnan, they further um, experiment with these ideas, with these communist ideas. And they also, it also serves as the main resistance base of the Japanese invasion. Hmm. By 1936, people in China, they start getting frustrated with Chiang Kai-shek because he's not standing up for the Japanese. He's not standing up to the Japanese army. And these campaigns against the Communist Party were just becoming unpopular. So what's interesting is that his own generals are like, we can't do this anymore. Like, we can't be a divided country and also fight the imperial japanese so they end up having almost a mutiny they put him under house arrest and until he, they force him down they go and say listen buddy you're making a peace a truce with the chinese communist parties we need to focus on fighting the imperial japanese we are getting wrecked they're not only um destroying us militarily but they're also they're committing massive amounts of war crimes and destroying infrastructure yep we need Genocide. to get our shit together and fight the Japanese army. So they create a second united front where, and Chiang Kai-shek is uh, reluctantly signing this, this piece. And to, and to give you some background, a little bit more of a context on the Japanese um, kind of uh, in, in, encroachment on, on China, Japan invaded Manchuria in 1931 and turns it into a puppet state called Manchuku. Uh, the Manchurian candidate. Yeah. In 1937, Japan launches a full-scale invasion 
of the Chinese mainland. And they open up two fronts. Um, the first front was from their power base in Manchuria. So they march, their one army is marching down. Um, the second front starts from Shanghai. So um, they, the plan was for these two armies to meet in Wuhan, which is in the center of the country. And they're in this march, the Japanese are committing war crimes um, all across the way. Um, for example, the most notable of these massacres is when the Japanese get to Nanjing, which is the capital of the nationalist government. They carry out one of the great massacres of the civilian population in the 20th century. The rape um, of Nanking. During this, this um, um, siege of a city, it's not really a siege of a city because it was just a... Uh, it was a it was pretty much just a bloodbath right so Shooting fish in a barrel there is um, enough evidence to suggest that during the occupation of Nan nanjing that the uh, japanese government was incentivizing the uh, killing of civilians there are japanese newspapers that are that are basically celebrating um japanese officers killing civilians with uh, uh with katanas yep samurai there's, swords just cutting them yeah up. there there's an there's like a japanese newspaper it's like man's kill man scores like uh has new high score killing 47 ja uh, chinese in one day it's real crazy yeah weren't they also like scalping too and shit I had to take a sip of water yep um if you ever read the book, The Rape of Nanking, um, they, she, she talks about like just the most obscene stuff like bayonetting babies and cutting pregnant women, cutting uh, babies out of pregnant women's bellies and just large scale sexual crimes and um, just killing all military aged men. One of the first things they do is they take all the military-aged men, they take them into a forest, and they machine gun them all dead. Jesus. So it, it was just a... Uh, it, it's it's a big point of contention between China and Japan today. It's a uh, argument that's still being had because Japan still um, denies a lot of the atrocities that took place in the rape of Nanking. But it was uh, pretty bad. It, to go further into, just to give you a sense of like some of the other things that Japan was doing during this war, is they had created a laboratory called Unit 731 oh, yeah. in Manchuria. We've talked about this on the show a few times, actually. In Manchuria, they had this uh, biological weapons lab. And uh, not only were they looking at biological weapons and studying um, different crosses of diseases like ebola and smallpox they were also doing a lot of studies on the effects of hypothermia they were kidnapping chinese people and they were doing human experiments on them like freezing them like freezing them and exposing them to diseases they were doing a lot of terrible things mm -hmm. a lot of the um and and hopefully you're proud of me for not making any like COVID nineteen jokes because we've talked about Wuhan a couple of times already, um, but a lot of the con conspiracy theories around uh, Wuhan being an in invented drug might just be coming from uh, from these stories actually. Maybe I made a joke when COVID nineteen first hit that uh, COVID nineteen came out of the la the Unit seven thirty one lab. Obviously, mm -hmm. I was joking. There's no, there's zero evidence right. to there's suggest no anything like that. that. Right. But I was like, oh, it goes back to the Imperial Japanese. They created COVID nineteen during <laughs> the during World War two as a weapon. And, I'm and sure the CCP unleashed. would love to to make that the official you know story. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure they would. It was the Japanese. It was Imperial <laughs> Japan. Um. But to what's interesting is that the head scientist of Unit 731, he was granted amnesty and was immigrated to the United States. Huh, just like just like all the Nazis that came over. Uh, yeah. Like Werner von Braun 
to make our spaceships and shit? Well, yeah, because they want their brain. <laughs> yeah, they want the information. You want access to their because you want to learn how to do that stuff. You're like, right. oh, so like, were you able to do it? And like, what they're like, yeah, what was, was what'd you learn? <laughs> like, you know, like right, it was uh, fucked up what you did, but what'd you learn? Like, okay, like tell me about it. So, like, you were able to do it? You were able to cross smallpox in Ebola? What happened? <laughs> Who, did he use it on somebody? Tell me you used it on. Like, between you and I. Just tell me. Did he use it on someone? Okay, did it work? What happened to him? <laughs> tell me all about it. Do you like, have what your happened to their skin? Yeah. Tell me about it. Did they bleed out of their ass? Oh, like. <laughs> that's fucked yeah, it's up. fucked up. Um, but to give you a sense right now, to go back, um. Once the Japanese occupied northern China, the the war right. turns more into a stalemate. And, and to give you a sense of who controlled what, the nationalists were based out of the southwest of the country, and the, and the, and the CCP were based out of the north in their in their main base in, in Yan'an. Um, from there, the Chinese Communist Party they pursue a campaign of guerrilla warfare uh, all across northern China. Mm -hmm. And what happens is for Japan, this ends up being like Afghanistan or, or Vietnam. Right. It's a it's Japan is unable to occupy China. It's a war of attrition. It's impossible against, against guerrilla warfare. Yeah, it's it's not. Yeah, it is. It is impossible for them to occupy all of China. They'll win a battle, an upfront battle against a Chinese nationalist party. Um, like the Chinese Nationalist Revolutionary Army, the NRA. They're going to win those battles. They may be able to take a city, but they're not going to... Stick they're around only going to control own. the ground that they walk on. Right. China is impossible to occupy. It is impossible. I mean, the only way that you can occupy an area that large is to enlist the support of the people there, and they're definitely not <laughs> enlisting any support with the things that they were... the atrocities that they were committing, you know? And... This is obviously a huge escalation in violence from the Japanese, but there's already a lot of hate and animosity towards the Japanese over the past, you know, since the Treaty of Versailles. And, I mean, th the first Sino-Japanese war happens against the Qing Dynasty. I mean, it, it's built back from really immediately when Japan starts to modernize. Hmm. They start kind of preying off China and all the other, their all their surrounding neighbors. Um, so... Chiang Kai-shek during this time, um, he, when America enters the war, when Japan decides to bomb Pearl Harbor, it's a, so I don't want to, this is like a, an easy place to completely fall off the rails and change subjects. So I need to, I need to, I want to stay focused on this, but Japan decides, makes the decision to bomb Pearl Harbor in response to the U.S.'s oil embargo. Mm. And they they make that decision is because they're running out of energy to to uh, continue pursuing their imperial escapades in China because it's going really wrong. Um, you know, the U.S. propaganda at the time was like, Japan has their own Mike Kampf. Yep. They are their own version of Mike Kampf. They want to take over all of the Pacific and eventually launch a campaign into California. The Japanese menace, the Imperial Japan, is going to take over the world. In reality, they were trying to continue their um, campaigns that were going really poorly. And they, what the term was, when they were trying to sell the arm, sell the war to the emperor, they were selling it as a surgical strike. Pearl Harbor, like it's mm. going to be a. They, they literally said it's going to be a surgery. Like it's like a surgery. We need to take out the tumor. That was the type of language that um, the um, that the warrior, that the, the emperor's warlords. military mm. advisors were, were right. giving him. Like this is going to be a surgical strike. We need to just like kind of force. We're going to destroy the Pacific Fleet real quick. We're going to force the U.S. into negotiations with us. So we will stop the oil embargo. That was the whole point of the strike on Pearl, strike on Pearl Harbor. During the first couple of months of that war, Japan's winning. They're not winning the war, but they win a bunch of. They, they score the they first. They win points. a lot of. They score battles. like two touchdowns yeah. in the beginning yep. of a of a game. But you right. know, inevitably, once the other team gets the ball back, they're going to score like As continuously. Exactly. Um, yeah. But they basically win a bunch of. Um, battles in the beginning, the first three months of the war. 
as soon as it it's, it becomes very clear that the U.S. is going to win the war by 1942 after the Battle of Midway, it becomes very very clear that right. um, Japan has no ability capacity to fight to continue fighting the U.S. Navy and the U.S. Marine Corps, and that it's going to be a really long process. It's going to be a four year process or a three year process at this point. For the the U.S. to island hop its way over to, to Japan, but they're inevitably going to be destroyed. Um, Chiang Kai Shek is able to anticipate the American victory very early on, so he doesn't really launch any major campaigns against the the Japanese army. He instead starts to have this very passive campaign, and he starts taking American military aim uh, aid. And he, he starts storing it to surplus for the ultimate confrontation the that he's going to have with the mm-hmm. Chinese communists after right, the war is right, done. Right, right, right. Mm-hmm. Because of this, the CCP becomes the more active resistance to the Japanese during the war. And it just leads to um, greater support from the Chinese populace. More importantly, Mao was able to paint the nationalist, nationalist as these corrupt agents of Western power. Mm-hmm. And he wasn't and wrong. When, yeah, I mean, I've said this before and I've heard this, you know, I've obviously heard this from other people, but they were the Chinese nationalists, but the Chinese Communist Party were seen as the true nationalists because they were the actual stalwarts against the, they were the vanguard against the Imperial Japanese right. when um, the Chinese Nationalist Party under Chiang Kai-shek was seen as um, very passive against them. When um, when Japan ultimately does surrender, there's an effort to create some type of post-war coalition between governments, but while this is happening, there's a lot of movement that's going on at grounds. Um, the Soviet Union declares war on Japan during the very last stages, and they occupied Manchuria um, they start to have bargaining pieces and in the negotiations uh, between, um, you know, the the negotiations between the CCP and the Chinese communists at the end of the war. Right, because they're and, holding a um, few chips of theirs, right? They're holding a few chips, but what essentially happens, and I'm going to be, I'm going to simplify this. China falls into the hands of the North China falls into the hands of the communist, and then South China falls into the hands of the nationalist. And the country just erupts into a civil war. Mm-hmm. The the victors of the civil war end up being the com- the Chinese communists, right? And they push the and, nationalists out all the way into Taiwan. Exactly, they push the nationalists out all the way into Taiwan, and um, that is where the the process of the um, as a, of the Chinese Communist Party becoming the main, um, becoming the sole political power takes place, you know, during these years after World War II. Mm-hmm. And eventually they, uh, they, they established the People's Republic of China in 1949 with Mao Zedong as the chairman of the party. And um, I guess the major point is that they're able to uh, galvanize the populace through their guerrilla warfare campaigns against the Japanese, which made it a lot easier for them to legitimize the, to claim their self the legitimate government at the end of the end of the war. I mean, this this kind of reminds me a lot of uh, when we were talking about you know the. Uh, basically the invention of the Chinese people. Uh, and we were talking about like the, how the, uh, ethnic, um, the ethnic changes, uh, were super, uh, the ethnic differences of the peoples were superseded by the, the, the state. And I think what's pretty interesting about this is, is like when we were reading about, um, like a uh, professor Fay from that episode, and he was saying how, um, and, and I'll, I don't have the quote up here, but I'll, I'll paraphrase. Where you're saying that you know a, a an identity or an ethnicity or like a nationality is is most often 
uh, created when you have something different to something outside to compare it to, right? And uh, if you take that in conjunction with you know this cycle of uh, Chinese warring states and then Chinese unification and then Chinese warring states, Chinese unification. This was kind of like the ultimate combination of the two. You know, at the at the time we have the the Chinese communists who are actually fighting the imperialists, right? And they're really holding up the you know the flag of um, you know uh, Chinese uh, uh, nationality, Chinese nationalism, right? Independence from colonialists and independence from foreign aggressors, and you know they. Uh, were able to formulate that national identity, you know, by making these comparisons to the other, to the Japanese specifically, uh, but also to the West in a certain respect, you know, because uh, again, the people's, uh, the, the, the nationalist state, uh, the nationalist government was taking aid from the West, but stockpiling it and holding it and, and being corrupt. So even the West is seen as the other in that respect. And, you know, it's all about like China and, and unifying China and doing things for China. And, and, you know, this is kind of like the ultimate culmination of all of those ideas that we've been talking about, you know, over the course of the last couple of uh, uh, weeks here. Um, I, th I think that that point didn't get lost on me when doing the research for, for the rise of Mao here, because I think he, he really takes, you know, uh, takes a lot of those ideas by the balls and makes it his own. Yeah. And, um, He's able to create the nat this national identity, which um, was the key to creating his state. And then and it's, the it's rest the only is... way that you can hold together such a large population. Yeah. You know, like such a such a big territory is is almost you know it's rare. I mean, the fact that we have a giant country is crazy rare as well. You know, the fact that Russia as a cohesive giant country is pretty rare. That the normal uh, you know out of the what is it, 200 plus uh, uh, nation states, like recognized nation states out there, like the majority of them are super small, you know? So to hold together, you know, disparate types of peoples across, you know, thousands of miles, you know, like that's hard. And in order to do that, you have to really formulate a national, like a strong, strong national identity. And, to, and a lot of countries all have multiple nations in it. Like Canada is a, has two nations, one country. Right. Right, there's, exactly. There's there is the French Canadian nation, and there's the the Canadian um, Canadian nation, Canadian <laughs> Canadian nations, <laughs> whatever the normal Canadians. <laughs> what is it? Normal Canadians and French Canadians? Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> the English speaking Canadians and the French Canadians. Yeah, fucking French Canadians. There's no Canada like French Canada. There's um, um the Netherlands. No, right. no excuse me, not the Netherlands. Um, Belgium that has their the Flemish uh, Dutch, and, the, and the Dutch and their and their uh, French speaking populations. Uh, I mean, France had a lot of different languages prior to them creating the French nation state. Italy did too. All these nation states took. We want to explore this in further episodes. Um, we're really interested in exploring this concept of like building, like what is it, how do you build a nation state? Like what are the structures that need to be in taken? Place. Yeah. What, what structures need to be built? How are these um, messages delivered on a national level to unify people? Um, how do you overcome ethnic and cultural, you know, uh, uh, conflict in order to create a nation state? And, and what I was thinking, I, I've said this a couple of times that, and, and now I'm starting to disagree that China is in the process of building a nation state with a blunt hammer in broad daylight. I think that it's not the process of building a nation state. It's the process of holding it together. Rather yeah, than building or, exp it. or, or expanding built. it, depending on how you look at it. Yeah, expanding it. And it's already been built, at least the actual. The groundwork um, of it has but so you now know, they're... we're in a changing landscape now and and like much like how china went through a uh you know a century of humiliation um you know when they weren't industrialized and and the rest of the world was industrializing you know i think that they're kind of we're hitting this precipice where the world is changing uh globalism you know is is very much in and china is like well we're not going to get caught with our pants down again Right, so they're trying to press on into this forward-reaching future, but I, but a lot of those, 
a lot of the ideas of, of you know, a, a global economy and a global society run counter to communism itself, you know? So how do they hold it together, you know? Well, China is not communist anymore. No. There's not nothing Marxist about their economic system at all. Like, right. They're, they're a um, totalitarian regime. They have... That's about all it shares with that, communism. That's about though. all it shares. But yeah. as a communist nation... They're, I mean, China is ready for business. You can right. become a billionaire in China. Mm -hmm. It's easier to become a billionaire in China than it is in the U.S. Right. Uh, there's more billionaires that come out of China than there there are in the U.S. at, at the current rate of of uh, at the at, at the current rate that yep. we're in right now. Mm -hmm. So it's it's interesting that China uses the Chinese Communist Party as I guess this. It's something that's um, is more of an identity rather yep. than an actual system. It's yep. just something that people can collectively um, get behind because, because it was I guess because it's useful. It's I, useful. It's useful, and I think this is again going back to this idea of like holding together this nation using this ideology that's clearly not like de facto or even de jure the process on the ground. Right? Like they are pretty much capitalist uh, and they're totalitarian, um, but. You know this uh, this communist identity is what holds all of these disparate peoples. Remember, we talked about fifty five unique, fifty six unique ethnicities in China, in the in the greater China. So, you know, how do you hold all these people together? If not, you know, like if they deny communism, if they're like, yeah, you know what, we're not actually communists anymore. Like, what do people have to, you know, hold them together? What kind of ideology do they do they have to supersede that? You know. Do they go back to for all Confucius? I think that's I think that ship has sailed. Uh, yeah, that's totally gone, right? Um, maybe uh, right now it seems like, and we've mentioned this in one of our last episodes. It seems like you know Xi Jinping is is pursuing legalism again, <laughs> you know, um, and 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 even some Machiavellian principles uh, to 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 make that even um, to make that connection again, um, but. <laughs> totalitarianism is the only thing that's holding you know like the the national identity of china together in my opinion yes um all right we are a hour and 30 minutes into this recording um i have to say we wrap it up all right all right thanks everyone for joining us for another episode of bro history and thanks um, for being patient with the late uh, uh oh yeah with the late re release yeah thanks for being patient for the re late release this will be released on sunday if the episode performs well we may make that a we may change our schedule to sunday releases so um, we'll see based off my personal podcasting habits i usually listen to more shows on sunday so and, and not very many shows on friday so maybe that would be a better day to do our releases we haven't really tried it so we might test that out uh, depending on the downloads of the next of this episode that comes out and um, if you would like to rate and review the podcast do it it and helps you can us also grow let us tremendously know. you can let us rate know when you the prefer podcast, to listen you know on apple just click on the five star write a review say hey you guys are great or you guys suck whatever you guys want but if you if you come at us with a you guys suck like give us some something you know give us something to work with <laughs> yeah because we we if, or if yeah, you come we, out with that we're, we're, we're racist then you know <laughs> use some examples yeah <laughs> saying that we I've watched Tucker Carlson is not a legitimate way it's not a legitimate <laughs> indictment of racism <laughs> um but yeah rate and review the podcast um is a it really does help us grow and. Um, yeah um, if you can join our Patreon account as well um, for uh, as low as a dollar of a month we release extended episodes um, some extra content on there um, so you can join us there and then next week our next week's episode we are going to be collaborating with our friend Neil from War and Conquest we'll be talking about Machiavelli we're going to continue this theme about going into Machiavellian politics and um, he's kind of a, um, he's a really good podcaster. I would encourage you guys to check it out, War and Conquest. Right now, Neil is running a show on Vlad the Impaler that's really interesting. 
So I would go ahead and check his show out. We're going to have him on next week, and we're going to dive into some, uh, you know, the Prince and uh, Machiavellian philosophy. All right. Anything else we should add? Um, no. no I think that, All that's right. It. All right. Peace, guys. See Enjoy ya. your weekend or week. Peace. Bye. <laughs>